the music of the heaters. And now, ladies and gentlemen, George Carlin! Thank you, thank you. Hello there. How's it going, everybody? Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And a couple more thank you, thank yous. I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about language tonight. You see, I don't like euphemisms. I don't like language that reflects fear and conceals the truth. You know, and, and I've noticed over a long period of time, as time goes by, people are less and less able to deal with reality. Americans can't really handle the truth, so they invent soft language to protect themselves. And it gets worse with every generation. Give me an example of what I mean. There's a condition in combat when a soldier or a sailor can't take it anymore, when he's ready to snap, all stressed out. During the First World War, they called that shell shock. Good, simple, honest, direct language, two syllables, shell shock. <laughs> Almost sounds like the guns themselves, that was 70 years ago. Then a generation later, we had the Second World War. Same combat condition was called battle fatigue. <laughs> Four syllables now, takes a little longer to say, doesn't hurt as much. Fatigue is a nicer word than shock. Shell shock, battle fatigue. <laughs> then, in 1951, we had the Korean War, and Madison Avenue was riding high by then. The very same combat condition was called operational exhaustion. <laughs> We're up to eight syllables now, and the phrase is completely sterile. There's no humanity left in it. Operational exhaustion sounds like something that might happen to your car. <laughs> then came the Vietnam War, and that only ended 15 years ago. And with all the lies and deceit surrounding Vietnam, it's not surprising that the same condition was called post-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> still eight syllables. We still have eight syllables. But we've added a hyphen. And, and, and the pain is completely covered by jargon now. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Maybe if we still called it shell shock at that time, those veterans might have gotten the attention they needed. There's a long... You know, over a period of time, there's a retreat from reality. Sometime during my lifetime, toilet paper became bathroom tissue. <laughs> Sneakers became running shoes. Motels became motor lodges. House trailers became mobile homes. Used cars became previously owned transportation. <laughs> and constipation became occasional irregularity. When I was a kid, if I got sick, I went to the hospital to see a doctor. Now they want me to go to a wellness center and consult a health professional. <laughs> Poor people used to live in slums. Now the economically disadvantaged occupy substandard housing in the inner cities. <laughs> and they're broke. They don't have a negative cash flow position. They're broke because some of them got fired. You know, fired. Management wanted to curtail redundancies in the human resources area. <laughs> so some of these people are no longer viable members of the workforce. Smug, well-fed, greedy white people have invented a language to conceal their sins. The CIA. <laughs> the CIA doesn't kill people anymore. They neutralize someone. Or they depopulate the area. The government doesn't lie, it engages in disinformation. <laughs> the Pentagon actually refers to and measures nuclear radiation in something they call sunshine units. <laughs> Israeli murderers are called commandos, Arab commandos are called terrorists. Conservatives refer to the Contra killers as freedom fighters. Well, if crime fighters fight crime and firefighters fight fire, what do freedom fighters fight? 
just asking, you know. And some of this stuff has gotten really silly, I think. Like, like on airlines, before the flight now, they say they're going to pre-board, which is a curious phrase in itself, <laughs> pre-board those in need of special assistance. Cripples. <laughs> Simple, honest, direct word. There's no shame in that word that I can find in any dictionary. In fact, it's the word that's used in Bible translations. Jesus healed the cripples. No cripples in this country anymore. We now have the physically challenged. No one's deaf anymore, the hearing impaired. No one's blind, we have the partially sighted. Psych psychologists actually refer to ugly people as those with severe appearance deficits. And of course, no one's stupid. They have learning disorders or they're minimally exceptional. It's getting so that any day I expect to hear a rape victim referred to as an unwilling sperm recipient. <laughs> and as we all know, in this country, there are no old people, senior citizens. And I'm almost used to that one by now. You know, I mean, that's really such a part of the language. I can almost handle senior citizens. The one I really can't take, though, is when they look at an old guy and they say, he's 80 years young. <laughs> 80 years young. Doesn't that reveal to you a certain fear of aging? And I know what that's about. I mean, I used to talk about my own, my own condition, and I would say, I'm getting older. Not old, older. Makes it softer, easier to take. Hey, I'm getting old. But thanks to our fear of death in this country, I won't have to die. I'll pass away. <laughs> or I'll expire like a magazine subscription. <laughs> if it happens in a hospital, they'll say it was a terminal episode. <laughs> Insurance companies will refer to it as negative patient care outcome. <laughs> and if it's a result of malpractice, they'll call it a therapeutic misadventure. <laughs> the language has gotten so bad, it makes me want to vomit. Not vomit. Makes me want to engage in an involuntary personal protein spill. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.